we are back in the world of Borodil, and this is my new segment called The Chronicles of Borodil. A disclaimer to my players, if you watch this, there will be a lot of spoilers. Uh, anything from, you know, lore between the players themselves, lore between NPCs that you guys meet, lore between the locations you visit. Um, I want to do this as kind of a way to get my ideas out there uh, so that I can look back on them because I'm not much of one to uh, keep a hefty bit of notes and stuff like that. I don't really like to type stuff out. I would rather talk about it and that helps me to remember it. So this is kind of, this is mainly for me, uh, but it can also be for my players. Um, granted, it's your responsibility to understand that if you do watch these, um, more than likely you could ruin um, some secrets that I have in the world. You could ruin your character arc. You could ruin, um, I guess, any sort of like surprise that may come upon you as a player. So take that with a grain of salt. Watch at your own risk. And for everybody else that's not involved in my campaigns, I hope you enjoy. So today, in the part one, or I guess part zero rather, of my Chronicles of Borodil, we're going to talk about my world of Borodil. The world of Borodil is my homebrew setting. I have taken bits and pieces from other locations uh, throughout, you know, like Eberron, the Forgotten Realms, Greyhawk, Dragonlance, all the official locations. I've taken ideas from other homebrew settings and things like that. Um, definitely uh, Matt Mercer's world and Matt Coville's world. I watch a lot of their stuff. And uh, there are a couple ideas that I've implemented from uh, a couple of my buddies themselves just because of what they've done in their homebrew world and stuff like that. Um, and all of it is, you know, thing, these are things that I think about all the time uh, when we're in between sessions and things like that. So, the world of Borodil is, it's a pretty large world. Uh, as you can see on this map, um, it doesn't look like it's that huge. Uh, it only spans 600 miles from one point to the other, uh, but granted you can go around. So this. This location in particular, I haven't really mapped out the extent to how big the actual world is, um, but there are more locations than just these four continents. That is probably one thing that my players don't know as of yet, because they are obviously in a time period where uh, the world hasn't seen significant changes since they started playing in this campaign. Um, they also haven't attempted to find out any more lore about the different locations and things like that. But, uh, you know, granted I haven't thought everything out, but I do intend for this world to be a lot bigger than just this. One day I hope to possibly make a huge map of all the different locations that we could possibly play in. Um, and when we start doing more campaigns and things like that, we can start playing in a whole different realm. Uh, we can play in the old realms in a different timeline and have fun with that. But yes, so this, this uh, what I'm about to show you, this is the first location, the first campaign map that I had given my players for my first campaign that I ever ran. Um, this was titled The World of Borodil, but while we were playing in it, I decided that this location down here was actually, oh, was like, actually, like, just one of the southernmost points of Borodil, and could be traversed, but there are stipulations to it. Uh, stipulations that I won't go into today because this isn't, you know... This is all old news, essentially. This is the very first campaign. We haven't revisited it in about a year and a half. Um, and we haven't, we don't really have any future plans anytime soon to go and revisit it. I would like to finish uh, what the party had started. They actually ended here in Summerbrook um, after fighting a Leshen. Uh, but then because the, the party had changed so dynamically, um, uh, the 
characters that I had started with, I only had one of them remaining with the party that ended up getting to some brook, so I decided let's make a brand new campaign with brand new characters, brand new world, brand new world, and this will be y'all's place because the other place I made for the other campaign uh, was for the initial group, which ended up disintegrating, so why not start on a new slate? Everyone agreed, so I decided to make the kingdoms of Borodil. I wanted, I wanted to have many factions with uh, different goals and objectives. I wanted their kingdoms to have different, you know, influences, different strengths and weaknesses, uh, imports, exports, all like all manners of stuff. So, the kingdoms of Borodil. The general premise of this campaign is that there are eight kingdoms. Vubrin, the Slidora, the Kirakuria, the Yodian, the Zirodel, the Titanian, Siavitas, and the Guista Empire. They were all founded roughly within the same time, uh, give or take maybe 200 years between, you know, a variety of them. Uh, but all within like a 200 year span, they all stood up and became the powers of the world. After everybody was uh, established, um, obviously that's when territory started becoming scarce between the different empires, and obviously war breaks out when that happens. War disputes, territory disputes. I'm stronger than you, you give me what I want or I'll take it from you. Cool, you can try war. This war, uh, it erupted, essentially it was like their own, like. Borodil's own version of the world war that we have uh, experienced twice. Um, it wasn't a specific group, though, that everybody was fighting against. It was everyone kind of fighting each other in different ways. Um, the party doesn't know a lot about the war. They're starting to learn things here and there as we play, and they're starting to learn uh, some of the ancient histories of the world because that's going to help them achieve their goals. But one of the main heavy hitting forces of this war was the Titanian Empire, which uh, one of my players, uh, Lacan, aka Oswald, has been playing or uh, yeah he's been playing a big role in developing titania he's given me all types of uh npcs to work with um the way that they do things um there's a lot more cities that are populated within here um that i don't i don't put a lot of cities on my maps i put just a couple of hubs maybe that they could go to and uh some major locations and then other than that, I want them to discover things or that gives me room to just add stuff if I deem it necessary. But Titania was hell-bent on essentially taking over the world. And uh, they had two major fronts against the Sea of Vetus and the Zerodel Empire. Um, granted, over the thousand years uh, that everybody was at war, different things happened where the Vubrin and Slidora Empire came together to attack Titania on their home soil. Uh, so t Titania had to pull back and this gave like, this gave all of those, the Slidora, Vubrin, Zirodel, and Siavitas empires, they were able to sort of drive Titania back into their own little, very naturally defended location. You've got cliffs all around uh, that make it very difficult for any side of outside of attack uh, from the sea. Um, their port is obviously heavily guarded. The mountain ranges have fortresses that line the sort of openings where foot travel is a lot easier, especially if you've got like caravans and things like that. Um, but yeah, the Titanian Empire was definitely a force to be reckoned with. Um, think of them as the Germany during World War II. Like, they are one of the heavy hitters, if not the biggest heavy hitter, that everybody's got an issue with. Uh, the Sea Vitus Empire, right here, these guys are a bunch of mages. Um, they are very gifted in the arcane. Um, and a reason that that is is because of this location south of them, the Twisted Wood. 
This location is essentially a portal to the Feywild, which, you know, in the lore of Dungeons and Dragons, there are portals to different planes of existence scattered all throughout the material plane. Uh, the Twisted Wood, because of how closely connected it is to the Feywild, has several portals throughout it um, that allow, you know, the Fey creatures to come and go as they please. Um, it also accidentally traps those that are born on the material plane into the Feywild with no way, no recollection of how to get back. Uh, when this happens, uh, in my lore, the Fey, essentially, when you spend too much time in a place that is not your own home, you start to change uh, drastically into the denizens of that place. So a human would become more Fey-like. Uh, they might get paler skin, brighter eyes, brighter hair colors. Uh, they might sprout wings. It depends on like what their background is. Granted, it takes a significant amount of time for this to happen. Um, like a couple years within the Feywild of you not returning at all, and eventually you will change um, to where you're almost not recognizable from your home plane. But that doesn't happen too often. Uh, people like to stay relatively close to their home, uh, especially after this thousand year war, everybody experienced peace for about 133 years or so before war broke out again. And we'll get more into that in a second. But yeah, the Sea of Vetus, they're a bunch of mages. Um, this is actually the location that a player, Alfric, uh, hails from. Uh, I won't go into specific player stories until we uh, actually sort of go through them in the sessions. That way other players don't figure out, oh, that's why he's so mysterious and stuff like that. Uh, so far, we've only done one character arc. Um, we've done the Zerodel, uh character arc for Gerald um, with his Luxodon brewmaster Zuka, a.k.a. Prince Rakim. But yeah. Back on track, Sea of Vitas, bunch of mages, uh, heavily influenced by the Fey and the Fey Wild. Up north, we have the Guista Empire, the frozen wasteland of the world. Uh, very harsh location to live in. Um, not a lot. This is one of the smaller, but stronger, I guess, kingdoms because of how much they have to endure just to survive. It also makes it to where it's not a very favorable location for people to attack during the Thousand Year War. But what it is favorable for is the um, the weapons that they can create with these with this enchanted ice that they found. Um, it's called Eternal Ice, I believe, is what I called it. I'd have to look in my notes, which I should probably have open. Uh, you can see how prepared I am for this. <laughs> this was a spur of the moment kind of thing, idea that I had a couple days ago. Um, but anyway, yeah, the, the Guista Empire, let's see. Oh, cool. I haven't named the ice, which is perfect. Uh, so, they have this ice that doesn't melt, even when put to the strongest flames. Um, granted, I don't believe they've ever tested it on, like, lava or anything like that. Um, I haven't really gone into that. The Guista Empire, they would have to travel to the Sleepy Peak in order to get close to any sort of, like, active volcano. And they're not particularly fond of doing so. So, they, they have this ice that never melts. That is their main way of making weapons. Um, it's cold to the touch, and because of how cold it is, if you don't have the proper equipment to handle this stuff, you end up getting major cases of like frostbite and things like that. This makes them a very formidable foe on the battlefield because just the you know just a minor nick of one of their uh, never melting axes. Uh, ends up causing you to lose a whole arm after a while. So even though they don't uh, have to really defend themselves, 
Their weaponry was highly sought after during the war because it was able to turn the tide, um, especially in terms of like archery and stuff like that. A whole volley of arrows, of never melt arrows, would be devastating against a force in the days to come. Because, you know, frostbite, if you don't have to deal with it, you don't have a cure for it. No one knew, except for the Guist Empire, they're the ones that had, you know, remedies for this stuff. They had all types of things um, in preparation to keep themselves from obtaining this frostbite. So that was that was one thing that kept the Guista Empire kind of in the loop during the war. Even though no one wanted to take them over, everybody wanted to deal with them so that they could get their hands on their weaponry. Now granted, using the Guista Empire's weaponry against them would be a very bad idea because it wouldn't be as effective since they know the ins and outs of these weapons. So if you know, you try and take them over, it's not going to really go in your favor because you will lose a lot if you were to wipe the Guist Empire out. The Titanian Empire down here, uh, like I've said, they were hell bent on conquest. Um, they've had a rich bloodline of Titanian royalty that have all just wanted to take over the world. Um, it started with the very first king, and the current king now follows the same sort of path. They are known for their uh, exquisite craftsmanship, their fighting abilities, uh, their ability to lead great armies to war with minimal casualties because of what they're able to craft. And all of this is thanks to the rich ore that they have an abundance of within the mountains that they live near. Not to mention they have all types of uh, forges and things like that near the sleepy peaks that they're able to craft in mass quantities all of these, um, these weapons. And because of the extreme heat of the lava, it tempers the armor to make it even stronger, it tempers the swords to make them even stronger. And it, Titania is just a very, like, a very robust group of craft, um, especially when it comes to uh, war equipment and things like that. The current state of Titania as of right now, and this is known to the players, is that there are about I think 25 members of the royal family, all the way from the king to all his children. Um, yeah, he's been a busy boy. Uh, but that's how that's how Reed has written the lore and I've started to take it, especially with my second campaign. Uh, they're starting to see how large the Titanian force is in reference to all the other places around the kingdoms. Uh, but yeah, they are a force to be reckoned with. The Zyrodel Empire, this is where uh, Prince Rakim, Gerald's character, is from. The Zyrodel Empire is essentially two uh, groups that had come together in order to fight off the Titanian incursion back during the Thousand Year War. The Zyrodels were a uh, large group of Luxodon um, and orcs that had come together after many, many years of uh, being at each other's throats, but they finally came to an agreement of sorts and worked together, and that is what allowed them to finally push the Titanian Empire back beyond uh, the Zyrodel borders and give them some peace while they tried to figure out the new social hierarchy. So the orcs, they live down in the southern region of the desert. They're more tribal in... Uh, retrospect to the Zyrodel Empire, which is more of like a, like a, think of an Arabian society in a way, mainly because they're in the desert and it just sounded fun. Uh, that's also how Gerald kind of wrote it. But they work together with the Zyrodel Empire being led by the Luxodon royalty. There is always a chance um, for the leader of the empire to shift into orc hands um, but so far the orcish leaders haven't uh, they haven't sought the position um, they've all come to the agreement that so far the luxodons are doing a 
valiant job at leading the entire country. So they don't see any reason why they should over try to overtake. So the Zerodel Empire is currently in a very, very uh, fragile state. Um, they're on the verge of collapse in the game itself, uh, where the characters are, you know, taking where their stories are taking place. And that, I think, will be its own video. The Yodian Empire, uh, this is a location that I've been trying to get my players, uh, especially the, the key ones from the last campaign, which is essentially everybody in my first group. Um, towards the later end of the first campaign, they started to find out more about the world, and I've injected a lot of that lore into the Yodian Empire itself. Um, without giving anything away to my group, the things that they know for sure is that the Yodian Empire is a kingdom of elves. Um, they also... They live in sort of like a, uh, I guess, sort of like a savanna mixed in with a jungle area. Like, that's the demographic of their, or the geographic location that they're in. Um, but the elves... The elves of my world are different in that elves don't die. Um, they never die. They kind of go through the reincarnation circle. Um, but the way that that happens is they serve their time on the material plane. And they live upwards to, you know, anywhere between 900 to 1,000 years, give or take, somewhere around that. And as long as they don't die uh, before that, they go through a ceremony called the crossing. This crossing, what it is, is, is essentially the one of the creatures of the Fae comes through uh, to the material plane and they escort the old member of the elven community to the Feywild, where they will undergo that change I was talking about uh, over here in the Twisted Wood. As they overcome or undergo this change, um, fey creatures that have died um, or have passed or have come to their peak in their life cycle will then take the place of that person that just crossed after you know so many weeks, months, or years pass, and it's essentially an everlasting cycle between the elves and their fey counterparts in the fey wild. So it. And it, it kind of goes in with the lore of how the trance works. Um, when they go into their trance, elves, uh, the younger they are, the more they remember about their old past. So elves, their past is in the Feywild, whereas fey creatures, their past is the material plane. So it's, it's a cool little concept. Um, it's not fully fleshed out because it doesn't need to be yet. Um, one thing about my DM style is a lot of it I try to let the players create um, so that they actually feel like they're making an imprint on the world itself. Uh, I like this style. So far it's worked for me and my group. They it, they feel like, I think they feel like they've had a sense of accomplishment making things and getting to experience what their ideas with uh, a touch of my ideas, uh, how far it can go. Yeah, the Odian Empire, they're probably, if they're not the strongest empire in this world, uh, they're definitely uh, in, they're definitely a contender for it. Um, they, yeah, elves are just strong by nature in uh, pretty much every, like, you know, fantasy genre, elves are, like, up there. And that remains true here. The Vubrin Empire over here, this is a very, very agricultural-centered empire. Um, they are not, they're not really an empire per se. Uh, they are ruled, I guess, by a council of druids. Um, and the druidic arts uh, excel in this location, uh, mainly because of all the nature. Uh, they farm, they produce wine, uh, you name it, if it has to do, or if it has to do with agriculture, you name it, they do it. Uh, also, the swamp has very fertile soil uh, that they're able to use. They're able to harvest stuff from the swamp, bring it back to their farmlands, and that's why they're so prosperous in their agricultural endeavors. 
So this council of druids, um, I haven't fully fleshed it out just yet, but they they go through their life uh, trying their best to keep everyone on the sort of same page, uh, following nature's path. They don't really meddle in the politics of all the other uh, locations until in the Thousand Year War when the Titanians started to see, like, they started to stagnate in taking over the Sea of Etus and Zeradel empires. So this was their opportunity to go overseas and try to take over the Vuberin and the Slidora empires. Uh, during that time, they figured out the, the Slidora Empire, uh, to attack them in their open fields is very foolish. Uh, it's not going to go well for you. So they took to fighting the Vuberin Empire, um, but that also didn't really go well either, uh, as the Vuberin Empire being so skilled in natural magic and the Titanians being, uh, you know, heavily armored. Uh, heat metal is a son of a bitch towards a Titanian. Uh, you can ask Reed that because <laughs> I have done it to him. Uh, but yeah, the Vuberin Empire, they are they are one with nature and I would say more than 50% of their population is a druid, uh, which that means they have pretty much utter control of all the flora and fauna in their location. Uh, to go to war with the Vuberin Empire is to go to war with the land itself which is why they have remained uh, quite powerful. Even though they don't seek out anything, they are perfectly content with what they have. They will defend it um, with all that they have. The Slidor Empire is the kingdom of the Horse Lords. Think of them as kind of like the Dothraki in a way. Um, the horse is like their, their main premise, I guess. They're really good at uh, cavalry, um, they have a decent outlook or decent equipment because of the ore that comes through the ancient rise. So they also excel in open field combat. But once you start to get to places like the Vuberin Empire that excels at you know using nature and trees and stuff like that, the Slidora Empire is kind of at a disadvantage with their horses and their spears. Uh, another thing about the Slidora Empire is they have a group. Um, they're they're kind of like a a religious folk, um, and with this religion comes uh, inquisitors that try to find people that uh, that aren't really worshiping the deities that they should be whether they're evil or someone that opposes the Slidoran uh, deities. The Inquisitors are kind of like the... They're right underneath the royal family. So the royal f family of Slidora holds the power, but the Inquisitors are the ones that are uh, given access to that power to make sure everything runs smoothly in the Slidora Empire. So far, the party has met one of these Inquisitors. Her name was Oksana. And when they were coming through the Slidora Empire, they had to go through her uh, and gain her approval before they were even allowed into Slidora uh, lands. So they're, they're, they're fun. Um, I haven't really fleshed them out enough, uh, especially with the party being there. I've, Right now, the party, they don't really seem to be interested in anything that has to do with the kingdoms individually. Uh, they're more interested in trying to figure out how to stop the demon lords that are uh, trying to take over from taking over. The Kirikuri Empire, um, their story is quite fun. They live in a location that has a forest of trees that are a mile long and about half a mile thick. So as you can tell, well, maybe not half a mile thick because then that's only 180 trees. But uh, anyway, they're, they're really big trees. 
That's one reason this place is called the Giant's Forest. Uh, there are other reasons, of course, but the party hasn't been here yet, and I don't want to spoil it. Um, but the Kirakuri Empire is a major it's a majority of seafaring uh, styles when it comes to like their markets and what they do best. Uh, they're really good in the water. And the reason for that is the giant's forest is extremely easy to get lost into. The dense fog and the fact that all the trees look about the same um, and the denizens that live within the giant's forest aren't necessarily friendly. So if you get lost in the giant's forest or if you're there for too long, uh, the people of the Kirakuri Empire consider you uh, lost, a lost one, essentially. So they like to stick to the outer perimeter. Um, one of these trees can produce, you know, hundreds of ships. Um, and they've only chopped down, you know, they've chopped down less than 50 uh, to produce their fleet that they have. Um, it also is like the source of their economy. They're able to ship these uh, this lumber to the other empires in order in like mass quantities in order to make their money uh, they also do a, a large amount of fishing so they know a lot about the coasts and the wildlife that lives within the waters and they've had a very close relationship with the merfolk um, that live that the merfolk live all types of cities around you know the oceans there's many different uh, kingdoms of merfolk, I guess you could say, or maybe maybe they'd better, uh, maybe different townships. Uh, all the merfolks are essentially one kingdom. Uh, I think the kingdom's name is, uh, Kirsten made this one. Da -da -da. I'm trying to find what she named it. It's, we haven't really uh, gone to it, but the capital name is Vaporis. Over here in the empty, sw yeah, empty swells, and they are they're the 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 main structure that keeps all the merfolk kind of tied together. Um, but they also have a very good relationship with anyone who is a seafaring empire, uh, namely the Kirakuria. These guys are always at sea doing the things uh, that seafaring nations do. And finally, that brings us to the City of Guilds. Um, the City of Guilds is essentially where we started the campaign. The s whole premise of that is in the middle par portion of the Thousand Year War, a group of mages came together uh, to try to find some way to end this bloodshed that was going on between all the nations fighting. Uh, their solution was to make a neutral empire and eventually they were going to grow the population to a point to where uh, all of the empires would have to come into the city of guilds in order to uh, do their trading, to uh, do their training all types of stuff. That way they had no reason to bicker towards other locations for having things that they don't have because they can go to the city of guilds to get it. They formed a group known as the Peacekeepers. These Peacekeepers are essentially a mercenary faction. Uh, they were given tasks from each of the empires on the regular uh, that they would send individual groups to go and deal with. This made it to where the empires themselves didn't have to have a large standing army, which, one, that brings the tension down between empire to empire, especially like the Sea of Vitas and Zyrodel. They don't have to worry about the fact that Titanian's uh, forces almost double, if not triple, the size of the Zyrodel army and the Sea of Vitas army. So with everybody sending their uh, their troops to the city of guilds to bolster that up and turn them into peacekeepers to go out and solve the world's problems, that was these mages' uh, train of thought, essentially. If we make a hub that everybody kind of goes through and has equal share in, there's no reason to fight. 
And it worked for a little while. Uh, the city of guilds didn't become prominent uh, until the end of the Thousand Year War, once the treaty uh, was signed to end the war. And it lasted for about 133 years before war inevitably broke out again. But the reason war broke out was because of the fact that the demon lords uh, were starting to come out of the uh, their abyssal layers and come to the material plane in an attempt to take it over in a way. Uh, my first party knows exactly why they're why they're why they are here, and from what they were told by the demon lord Sigorius uh, here in the Zerodel Empire is that every couple millennia the demon lords come to the material plane. They raise an army from scratch and they fight each other uh, for the title of Demon Prince. So, there are a limitless amount of Demon Lords out there, technically. Uh, stat blocks wise, there's only, you know, a handful of them, but I've created a couple of my own. Uh, the party hasn't figured out who all of them are. They know a couple. They know that the Sladora Empire is being invaded by Baphomet. Uh, the demon lord of the minotaurs essentially uh, the city of guilds ended up they were being attacked by yanagu and his gnolls but a very prominent figure that they've met a lovely woman uh, known as ennis craft uh, she held the key to the city of guilds salvation and was able to uh, essentially stop any sort of battle between the demon lords and the city of guilds party have no idea how that happened uh more than likely they won't find out that'll probably be its own video on ennis craft because she's one of my favorite npcs in this uh in this game if not my favorite but yeah she's a very powerful person um to be able to keep all the demon lords from attacking the city of guilds but they know yeah baphomet yanagu sigorius uh was brought uh, into the world by the orcs because they started to figure out that they were being treated unfairly from the Zerodel Empire and that'll be you know its own story uh, Dagon he is he's somewhere in this you know expansive ocean um, and currently he has uh, kidnapped essentially all the merfolk um, the Guista Empire also has a demon lord, but I don't know if I've told them... I don't remember if I've told them what his name was. I may have. Uh, but it's the demon lord of wrath, uh, Koschichi. Koschichi. Uh, he's essentially... He was brought from the Frost Giants. They summoned him, and they essentially destroyed the Guista Empire. So right now the Guista Empire is thought to be nothing but rubble. Uh, the Sea of Etis Empire is thought to be nothing but rubble uh, due to the Titanians. The Titanian Empire doesn't seem to be being fought by any demon lords uh, for whatever reason and they're bolstering in size and in, uh, in their conquests. The Zerodel Empire is on the verge of collapse because of the Titanian Empire and uh, Sigorius and his orcs taking them over. The Odian Empire is fine. Uh, they're fighting a demon lord, um, but they're kind of on the winning side thanks to their fey origin and stuff. The Kirikuri Empire is engulfed in an uh, impenetrable fog, uh, and no one is able to come in or come out, and who knows why. The Sladora Empire is currently neck and neck with Baphomet, but obviously demons are infinite and Sladora is not. So they're starting to, the, the tides are starting to turn in favor of the demons. And the Vuvarin Empire also doesn't seem to be affected by these demon lords as of yet. So that's kind of a main overview of the, uh, the lore of the world. Um, I might get into like going more in depth about the Thousand Year War and kind of fleshing that out a little more, but this is kind of just to go like kingdom by kingdom to figure out who these guys are, what is their main, you know, thing that they're known for, especially during the Thousand Year War, and uh, where are they now. 
Uh, so hopefully, hopefully you've enjoyed this uh, the first episode of the Chronicles of Boradil, and it, it was a lot of fun just kind of going through my thought process and just getting it all out there on video. Uh, so until we see you next time, peace.